Well, uh, good morning, uh, good afternoon, good evening to everyone. Uh, it's my pleasure being here uh, sharing uh, with you uh, the first uh, ISSM uh, webinar of the ISSM webinar series. Uh, it's a very, a very uh, hot topic in our days. Uh, this is uh, sex and the COVID-19, the state of uh, the science. And this is a joint uh, session with the uh, International Society of Sexual Medicine, ISSM, and the Journal of Sexual Medicine, uh, JSM. Uh, next. So uh, the ISSM vision and mission uh, are described here. Uh, our vision is that every human being has the right to a healthy and satisfying sexual life. Our mission is to be the most respected and trusted source of information, education, and professional development of human sexual health through the delivery of world-class publications, research findings, online and in-person opportunities for knowledge exchange worldwide. Next, please. So uh, if you can see here in the old map, uh, we are present in all continents. Uh, we have the North American Society, Latin American, European, uh, Middle East, uh, South Asian, and Asian Pacific societies. We are now uh, are more than 2,500 members all around the world. And we have members from 1995 uh, countries. So uh, we can uh, be really proud that we are reaching uh, most of the parts of the world. Next. So uh, we have four journals in our family journals uh, that is uh, free for the memberships. So we are, we are all aware of it. The Sexual Meds Journal of Sexual Medicine, the Sexual Medicine Open Access, the Sexual Medicine Reviews, and the Video Journal Prosthetic in Neurology. So this is free for all members uh, and the very high scientific uh, journals. Next. So uh, the ISSM webinar series began uh, uh, the idea as there will be no world meeting on sexual medicine uh, in 2020. So the ISSM will be offering uh, monthly webinars instead. Uh, topics will be covered, uh, will include the best of JSM lectures and also the state of the art lectures of the world meeting uh, that would happen uh, this year. Remember you, it was postponed to November 21. This webinar is the first webinar of the ISSM webinar series and is organized in cooperation of Journal of Sexual Medicine. And you can check in this site, the ISSM info webinars for the uh, up-to-date, the schedule of the other ISSM uh, uh, webinars in this series. Next. So I'd like to introduce our moderators of this, uh, of this webinar. Uh, it's Dr. John Mulhall. Uh, he's the editor-in-chief for the Journal of Sexual Medicine, professor of urology at the Cornell University, and the director of the Department of Sexual and Rep Reproductive Medicine of the Memorial Sloan Kettering Cancer Center in New York. And also uh, the uh, Ana Maria Giraldi, she's professor in psychiatry with a specialty in clinical sexuality. Uh, she is PhD at the University of Copenhagen and, sexolo and Sexological Clinic Psychiatric Center, Copenhagen. She is the president-elect of ISSM and the deputy editor of the Journal of Sexual Medicine. Uh, please welcome John and Anna Maria and uh, take over to lead this webinar. Thank you for participating. Thank you so much, Louis, and welcome from John and me to this webinar. Uh, it's a pleasure to have you all here. I can tell you that we have participants from all continents except from the Arctic. We think we have more than 230 participants now, and we are so happy you're joining us for these seminars or webinars. So I want to thank, first of all, John for arranging this uh, from JSM together with ISSM. And if you have, give me the next slide, Meryl. 
I just want to thank the faculty. We have an outstanding faculty. We have some outstanding speakers that will talk about topics that are related to sexual behavior, what is happening in a COVID time, and how is the pandemic influencing people's sexual behavior and health. The next one. So the way we are going to do it is we'll have our four speakers and they will give their lecture. It's about eight minutes each. And after the beginning of the lectures, we will ask you to send in questions. And the way you do it is that you use the question and answer button and you can write a question and John and I will moderate the questions and pick some of the questions. We hope that there will be so many questions that we will not be able to respond to all of them but we really want you to ask questions for the speakers so we can have a discussion, even though the format is different from what we know when we meet in person. So please do send in your questions when we finish and we will try to make as many of them as possible. The next one. So this is just to let us get started. We have four excellent speakers that are waiting for, to give their talk, the next one. And the first speaker, it's really an honor, a pleasure to introduce Joana Cavallo from Portugal. She is an assistant professor at the Universidad um, Lusofana de Humanitatadas Tecnologias in Lisbon in Portugal. She is uh, assistant professor in psychology, and she's also an associate editor of the Journal of Sexual Medicine. And what Joanna is, Joanna is going to cover is a talk on hypersexuality, sexual violence, and pornography utilization during pandemics, epidemic, uh, epidemics, and uh, during the COVID uh, pandemic. So welcome to you, Joanna. Thank you, Anna Maria. Also, Luis and John for having invited me for this set of presentations. And congratulations to ISM and GSM for this great initiative. I will do this brief talk on hypersexuality, sexual violence, and pornography consumption during COVID-19. Because we don't have much data at the moment, let me start by sharing with you some uh, past reports on other crises such as Ebola or Zika. Next one. Thank you. Now, in the past, we have seen increased sexual violence within intimate relationships, also rape, and also increased sexual abuse of children during school lockdown. So in the past, during Ebola or Zika, there was this great focus on sexual violence issues. And we already know that these were long lasting effects. Now at the current stage of COVID-19, I believe we are not only looking for uh, the scenario of sexual violence, for example, but we are also doing this breach that connects uh, mental health problems with some conditions such as sexual violence, for example. And we are doing this at the moment. Next one, Meryl. Thank you. We are doing this at the moment because for the first time in recent history, uh, all countries, including the rich countries, are leaving this great imbalance between increased distress and decreased opportunities to face adversity. And this is something new at a worldwide level. Now, in the mental health context, we know that if we combine these two conditions, we likely increase the risk of very serious um, sexuality conditions, such as sexual violence, for example. Next one, Meryl. Thank you. These conditions may be intimate partner violence, gender-based violence, and also violence against children, whether this is emotional violence, physical violence, and of course, sexual violence. So I believe that most professionals who work within the intersection between forensic and clinical sexology are now expecting and being prepared for the mental health boosting effects of COVID-19 on conditions such as hypersexuality, sexual violence, and also out of control pornography consumption. And we are doing this because can you give him the next slide, please? We are doing this because we have this theoretical assumption that uh, despite hypersexuality, sexual violence and pornography consumption are very different concepts, of course, they are sometimes related 
and they all share the same psychological underpinning, which is lack of emotional regulation. So we know that hypersexual individuals lack skills in terms of emotional regulation. We know that negative effect triggers sexual violence and increases the severity of sexual violence. And we also know that out of control pornography consumption may emerge as a response to negative moods such as anxiety, frustration, and boredom. We call this a sexualized coping behavior. It means that individuals use sex, including non-consented sex, as a means to achieve emotional homeostasis. And this is fine, this might be adaptive, unless this is the only coping resource individuals have or believe they have. And that's why we are doing this connection with the time of COVID-19, because we lack so uh, uh, adaptive coping resources at the moment. Next one. Now let me show you evidence from COVID-19. We know there's been an increase in pornography consumption. However, I believe that the scientific question here is not if people are watching more pornography. The question of scientific interest is why are people watching more pornography during such a humanitarian crisis? What is the function of pornography? What motivates people toward watching pornography instead of reading a book, for example? So we have to understand the meaning of using pornography. And we also have to understand who is watching pornography at the moment. Is everyone or instead are we talking about very specific typologies of individuals who may share some kind of psychological or psychopathological condition? And that's the only way you can have to connect this with a better clinical practice. And we also have to, to look at the second point, which is the dark side of pornography. We know at the moment uh, we have several crime agencies, European crime agencies, already reporting an increase in child pornography and grooming toward adolescents and children. And this happened very, very fast during the early phases of social distance and confinement measures. So we now believe that children and adolescents, or some of them, can actually be a risk of sexual abuse and online offending behavior. Next part of the slide, please. Now, this is the only academic study that I found. We still don't have much research in this area, and I believe this is still a preprint at the moment. In this survey, 5% uh, of respondents reporting experience intimate partner violence, and among this, 30% reported experience sexual violence. And the interesting point here is that one month prevalence, so the month of confinement, almost equals one year prevalence. So this is a small picture of what we can expect uh, in, in, in other phases of COVID-19. Next one. Well, because we don't have much data, let me show you uh, 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 an unpublished study, and I must disclose that I'm also an author in this one. Um, this is still under preparation, and this is a different approach. This is a qualitative study conducted with Portuguese clinical sexologists about their perceptions on the impact of COVID-19 in sexual health. And among the different themes that emerge, we have the theme of sexuality and technology. So we have our clinical sexologists appraising that uh, patients and clients are now watching more pornography, possibly as a result of increased distress. But this is a very uh, preliminary um, result at the moment. Next one. Now, despite we don't have much academic data, uh, some of these topics are very serious, such as sexual violence and, and sexual, uh, sexual violence within intimate relationships. So I consider here some uh, general take-home messages. I believe this is the time um, to have a more comprehensive assessment uh, uh, in terms of consider all the stressors that are emerging specifically for COVID-19. We also have to consider the interplay between mental health issues and dysfunctional emotional regulation in conditions such as hypersexuality or risk of violence. So we have now to do this bridge between mental health and dysfunctional patterns of sexuality. We can do this by 
promote e-health. So we can use e-health tools to increase the monitoring of emotional symptomatology and also to adjust uh, uh, individual scoping strategies on a more regular basis. And this is a way uh, uh, to prevent and to decrease the risk of sexual violence, for example. And finally, I know that despite uh, most clinical sexologists uh, intervene in, in intimate relationships. I believe most of, the, most of them don't have a very solid knowledge in terms of sexual violence within intimate relationships. And so this is the time to search for additional knowledge in this very specific area of sexology. Next one, Meryl. Thank you. Uh, finally, let me share with you the iShare project. This is a collaborative research project including 30 countries and you can visit the website. Um, these are countries, uh, um, low, middle and high income countries and in the future you might have a picture of the data, worldwide data regarding uh, uh, all facets of sexuality including violence, mental health and of course pornography consumption. Thank you. Thank you so much, Joanna, for raising these questions that we need to study in the future and we need to find out what is going to happen in the future. So let me go to the next speaker. Can I have the next slide, please? So the next speaker is also a pleasure to introduce uh, Professor Sharon Paris from New York. Uh, Dr. Paris is a professor of medicine and clinical psychiatry at uh, the Weill Cornell Medical College in New York. She's also the past president of the ISWI, the International Society for the Study of Women's Sexual Health. She's a board member at ISSM and she's the past associate editor of the JSM. And Dr. Paris has specialized or is a specialist in especially uh, women's sexual health and what she's going to talk about is sexual behavior in women during the COVID-19. So a warm welcome to you, Sharon. Thank you very much, Anna Maria, and to uh, John and Luis and ISSM and JSM for sponsoring this very important seminar. And next slide. So um, these are my disclosures. Next, please. I'm first going to speak to you about what is known about changes in sexual behavior and satisfaction. And the research emerging on this is quite limited. I'm going to focus on um, several studies that are either online or in press in the Journal of Sexual Medicine and a few other comments. There are messages being uh, released by different governmental organizations about what people should do about sex. For example, where I live in New York, the Department of Health has put out the message that we should be aware of the importance of safer sex in COVID-19. And this isn't specific to women, it's for all genders, but it gives you a sense of the kind of messaging that individuals are receiving in high risk areas. The virus spreads through saliva, mucus, breath, and touch. We don't know if it's sexually transmitted, but these behaviors should be avoided. There, are, there may be virus in the semen and the feces, and that you are your safest sex partner. The next safest partner is somebody you live with, and you should limit sex with anyone outside your household. So, you know, the impact of this messaging as well as internalized contagion, et cetera, is of interest, especially to the sexual behavior of women. Next slide, please. First, I'll speak about an article that's online in the Journal of Sexual Medicine. And this is a study um, entitled Changes in Sexual Behaviors in Young Women and Men During the Coronavirus Disease uh, 2019 Outbreak. And it's a convenience sample from an epidemic area. Next slide. The methods were that uh, two, Han Chinese men, 270 and 189 women, and I'll refer to the women uh, data, aged 18 to 45, they were relatively young, they completed an online survey. There were 12 items about demographics and past and previous sexual behaviors, and then an additional question about what they intended to do after the epidemic was over. Do you intend to increase the number of sexual partners or risky sexual behaviors? And they were the, those behaviors were defined related to condom use and the casualness of the partnerships or multiple partners. The key results in women were that 30% reported a decrease in the number of partners and 32% reported a decrease in the sexual frequency. 
And interestingly, the secondary outcome showed that 18% were inclined to increase the number of sexual partners or risky sexual behaviors once the epidemic had ended. Next slide. This table shows some additional results. Uh, both the men and the women, the majority lived with their family, but this was more true for the young women. About a fifth had reduced sexual desire, but that was not a validated questionnaire. Again, not a validated questionnaire, but approximately 40% had reduced satisfaction. 8% did reduce risky sexual behaviors, but the rates of these kinds of behaviors were low to start. Next. So the study concluded that during the height of the epidemic, sexual activity, frequency, and risky behaviors declined, and therefore sexual health suffered. There were some limitations. This was a small convenience sample, and it was a single ethnicity, as well as the fact that many of these individuals live with their parents, so this may limit the generalizability across the globe. There was a lack of randomization, and they did not use the standard or verified questionnaires, and it was retrospective in terms of the evaluation. So some of the implications for us who practice sexual medicine uh, are that high-risk sexual behavior in multiple partners may only be temporarily modified, and this you know, may be an opportunity for education because women, about 20% of the women said they intended to increase those behaviors. And overall, sexual health and sexual behavior is a potential area to be recognized and addressed with interventions by sexual health experts leading the way. Next slide. Now I'll move on to the topic of social distancing. And there are a number of messages that get, get promulgated throughout the world. You know, the distance we should walk apart from one another when we need to wear a mask, how close we can get when we're having a conversation or other activity, and then specific guidance about how to interact with people who do, do and don't live with us. Next slide. This online study recently published in the Journal of Sexual Medicine talks about social distancing and sexual activity in the sample of the British public. Next. It was also a, a study about both men and women. It was larger than the one I just mentioned, close to 1,000 individuals, and about two-thirds were women. The age span was wider across from 18 to greater than 75 years, and it was a cross-sectional epidemiologic study administered via, via an online survey, again, with a multivariate analysis. There was a single question asked here, and the question was, on average, after self-isolating, how many times have you engaged in sexual activity weekly? And it was dichotomized into either at least once per week or zero. And 40%, and you could say that's high or low, but 40% engaged in sexual activity at least once per week. And let's look at some of the specific gender information. Next slide. So um, actually, this is not gender specific, but it was of interest that a higher number of days of self-isolation and social distancing significantly was associated with sexual activity. And so the explanation was that the longer people were home, the more likely they were to have an activity once a week. Um, it's not clear what the implications are of this, but let's move on to the next slide. And here, although the published graph is a little fuzzy, you can see the direction of the bar graph. And let's focus on the top, which looks at female. So female gender, older adult. So if you look at individuals 45 to greater than 75, and abstaining from alcohol was associated, of course, the bars on the left, with lower levels of sexual activity. Next slide. So the conclusions were that interventions to promote well-being during the COVID-19 pandemic should focus on positive sexual health messages to mitigate detrimental consequences of self-isolation and social distancing. The limitations here were self-report, and that this was, of course, cross-sectional, so it doesn't look at the trajectory over time and beyond, say, 11 days, what's going to happen with these sexual time frequencies and so forth. The implications are that we may want to target those with the lowest levels of sexual activity, certainly in terms of frequency. And, you know, sort of the balance, of course, has to be with the safety and prevention of disease spread information that we want to promote uh, regarding social distancing and sexual contact in the community. Next slide. Lastly, I'd like to talk about a study that's in press, again in the Journal of Sexual Medicine, and I love the name of this, Love in the Time of COVID-19, Sexual Function and Quality of Life Analysis During Social Distancing Measures in a Group of Italian Reproductive Age Women. So um, next slide, please. The aim was to assess the impact of social distancing measures on the sexual function and quality of life of non-infected reproductive age women living with their sexual partner. It was an observational analysis 
of sexually active women who previously completed validated questionnaires, the Female Sexual Function Index, which is the gold standard for sexual function across domains, the, the Sexual Distress Scale, also validated, and an, a quality of life measure called the SF36. And then they asked the women to complete these again four weeks after the introduction of the restrictive measures that were quite significant in Italy. It was less than 100 women, 89, and their mean age was around 40, 39, the range was 28 to 50. And at baseline, they had sexual frequency of specifically intercourse of greater than six per month, and it went down by more than half. That was the main finding. And there were some uh, associated features, working outside the home, a university education, and parity greater than one. They had lower sexual function scores. And let's turn to a bit more detail about their sexual function. Next slide. So you'll see here, this is all of the outcomes and some I've already mentioned, but let's focus on the FSFI scores and some of the domains. So the women before the COVID period had FSI, FSI scores that were above the cutoff of, for female sexual dysfunction of 26.5. And after the COVID period, after four weeks, their scores went down to 19, which meets the cutoff and below. They had decreased domains of desire, arousal, orgasm, and satisfaction, and higher distress scores and decreased quality of life. So these were all important findings about the qualitative experiences of women. Next slide. So the conclusion is that the COVID-19 epidemic and restrictive social distancing measures do negatively or may negatively impact numerous domains of sexual function and quality of life, specifically of women who are reproductive age and live with their partners. A small sample size, the fact that they didn't test psychological and mental disorders, although you hear about another study later where these tests were administered in a similar population. And there's no data on masturbation, something called self-heroicism, solitary, non-penetrative, and virtual sex. And we need to learn much more about that, given that that's the recommendation. Uh, the emotional health of the couple was not assessed. And so the implication is that in the future, we need to affect, assess the effect of stress, contagion, whether the person with whom they live is someone who's higher risk, you know, in the in health field, et cetera, how the presence of household members and their risk affects women, and what is the effect on the lifestyle if they're working outside the home or not on psychological states in conjunction with their function. Uh, next slide. I'd like to direct you to two position statements, ISSM and ISWISH. ISWISH is as the Female Sexual Health Society affiliated with ISSM. And the, the, the recommendations are similar to some of the things I showed you earlier, avoiding high-risk behaviors, kissing, rimming, and sex with someone outside your house, using uh, potentially condoms and dental dams, and washing everything, including hands and to toys, et cetera, with water. And consider the kinds of things that are lower risk, masturbation, vibrators, dildo, sex toys, phone sex, sexting, et cetera. And the, the last bullet um, is of interest, social distancing for all casual acquaintances coronavirus discord in couples, or whether either member of the couple is possibly infected, and I would add, or high risk in terms of their work and their time outside the household. Next and final slide. So the take home messages are that women's sexual health during the COVID-19 pandemic should be addressed with education and interventions by sexual health experts who are best poised to balance promoting healthy sexual behavior with risk reduction. All clinicians caring for women, I suggest, should screen for sexual function in the context of these infection risk concerns and social distancing mandates. We should pay special attention to targeting groups with lower reported sexual functions, such as older non-partnered women, and think about how to coach them creatively. And more research is certainly needed on optimal behaviors, masturbation, and virtual sex, and of course the impact of stress, the psychological states, and psychiatric disorders. Thank you. Thank you so much, Sharon, and I'm, I'm going to hand it over to you, John. So it's my pleasure to introduce uh, Paolo Capogrosso, um, who has spent a year at Memorial Sloan Kettering with us in urology. He is assistant professor of urology at the University of Insubria in Varese, Italy, and is also a, on the editorial board of the Journal of Sexual Medicine. So Paolo, please take it away. Thank you very much. Hello, everyone. It's a great honor for me to be part of this uh, wonderful faculty uh, speaking about sexual behavior in men. So first of all, I would like to show you that if you do a medline with COVID-19 and the word sexual, you will find around 100 results, which means that there is a lot of interest around this kind of topics, although only a few of these studies are really focused 
on the topic. Next slide, please. So the impact of pandemic on sexual behavior is mainly based on three factors. Social distancing, the psychological distress and negative mood associated with the lockdown, and the fear of contagion. Next. So the question is, is the pandemic really changing the sexual behavior in men? Next. So this is the first study that was published in the journal Sexual Medicine, actually. And it was conducted in China, as, as we've seen be before in the presentation before, included around 300 of men. And the outcomes were the changes in the, in the number of sexual partners, sexual desires and frequency, sexual behaviors, and also risky sexual behaviors. Next slide, please. I would like you to focus on the male uh, population characteristics. You will see that uh, next, around 70% of people were uh, living, of male uh, subjects were living with their parents. And of course, this will be the consequence of uh, uh, a reduced sexual desire next in uh, uh, about uh, 37% of, uh, sorry, a reduced number of sexual partners in about 52% of cases next, and a reduced sexual frequency in about 40% of cases. This is obviously a consequence of social distancing associated with the lockdown next. And then they also reported, although that 27% of male subjects were reporting a reduced sexual desire. And this may be associated next with the psychological distress, probably due to the lockdown phase. Although we don't have really data to support this. Next slide, please. So they also investigated risky sexual behavior, behavior defined as uh, inconsistent condom use, casual sexual partnership or multiple sexual partnership. And actually they showed that there were no risky sexual behavior in about 74% of men. And this is also something that of course is dealing probably with the social distancing situation. So they concluded that actually there was a reduced sexual activity frequency and risky sexual behavior and there was a negative impact of COVID-19 pandemic on sexual health. Uh, so next please. Uh, of course, this is something that uh, is dealing mainly for, um, with the social distancing rather than psychological distress. At least this is what the data of this study tell us. Next slide, please. This second study, which was conducted in the UK, about 30% of male out of uh, around uh, 1,000 of individuals included, they um, answered to this single question about sexual activity, which was investigating, investigated the average engaged in sexual activity per week. So what is important to notice from the methodology of these studies is that uh, people answer to this question, question at different time since the start of the lockdown and about 25 percent so about one quarter of, of the population uh, did answer the question only after zero to five days from the start of the lockdown phase and this is probably something that could have a significant impact on the on the final results because people may uh, probably they did not have enough time to cope with the lockdown problem uh, or enough chance to engage in sexual activity next please So uh, the main result was that 40% of the population reported to engage in sexual activity at least once per week on average. Is this uh, okay? Is this normal? Is this, <coughs> sorry, is this uh, too low? We actually don't know next because we don't have the baseline from, from these patients. So we don't know what is the baseline situation of this population. Next, please. And also it is important to show that 18% of the included patients were over 65 years. So uh, once again, it is important to uh, understand that probably 40% engaging uh, um, one sexual activity per week with 18% over 65 may not be so different from the normal situation. And also 44% of people were single 
So they probably they were living alone, and so they probably were facing social distancing, reducing the chance of sexual activity. Next. Next slide. They also show that uh, there was a different level of sexual activity according to the days from the start of the lockdown phase. And you will see, you can see that people with longer time from the lockdown uh, started, uh, they had higher sexual activity, which means, uh, suggests probably that they had more time to cope with the lockdown phase uh, and with the pandemic, and they had also more chance to, to, to engage in sexual activity. Next. They finally concluded, as we, we have seen in the previous presentation, that there were few characteristics associated with lower level of sexual activity, which was the female gender, older adults, and of course, people not married. Next slide. In these third studies, which was conducted in Bangladesh, India, and Nepal, uh, the authors uh, uh, included only people who were married, which is quite interesting because we remove all the, um, the, 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 all the, the, the people, the individuals that may not engage in sexual activity because they were affected by social distancing. And so they investigated the frequency of sexual intercourse during usual time as compared to the lockdown phase. Next slide. And they show that actually there was no difference between uh, the usual time and the lockdown phase in terms of sexual intercourse frequency, which is, uh, I think, a very interesting and important result. Next slide. Next. In this last study, which was conducted in Italy, uh, including about uh, 1,500 people, uh, they looked at depression, anxiety, and also sexuality and doubt or erotism during the lockdown phase. Next slide. You can see here uh, that actually the authors reported that 84% of, of, of uh, people included did not uh, engage in sexual intercourse during the quarantine. Uh, although there was 40% reporting an increased sexual desire and 40% reporting an increased autoerotism. Uh, these results have to be probably reconducted to the very uh, low mean, median age of the population included, which was 21. And so once again, probably social distancing for these uh, uh, subjects included, included in the study was the main factor affecting the frequency of sexual activity and intercourse because they were probably more frequently single or living with their parents. Next slide. Next. So the answer to the first question, is the pandemic really changing sexual behavior in men? Well, we do not have good quality data, but certainly we know that social distancing has an impact of sexual activity and especially among younger who are probably living alone or with their parents. Next slide. The second question is, should we change our sexual behavior? And this is obviously concerning and uh, related to the fear of contagion. Next slide. So as, as you will see in the next presentation, there is actually conflicting evidence regarding the presence of virus in seminal vaginal fluid. So regarding the risk of contagion during the conventional, I would say, uh, sexual route. But uh, however, uh, the virus can be transmitted by other routes during sexual intercourses, which is oral and anal contact, and this has been already demonstrated. So I think that both healthcare providers and uh, uh, patients should be aware of this, and we should uh, keep in mind uh, in the next month this kind of uh, danger. Next slide. Finally, I would like to point it out that the overall quality of research during the COVID-19 phase was actually low. And this is very important because we need to um, uh, interpret the results properly also according to the methodology of the studies that have been reported so far. Next slide. So the final take home message is that social distancing due to the COVID-19 pandemic has led of course, to an overall decrease of sexual activity, 
there is no convincing evidence showing an increase of sexual dysfunctions during the lockdown phase, at least in men in these uh, studies that I show you. And the longitudinal effect of lockdown on sexual function deserves to be monitored and investigated in the next month. Thank you. Thank you, uh, Paolo. And uh, we already have some questions for you at the end. Uh, next, it's my uh, very, very great pleasure uh, to introduce uh, Professor Dori Lam. Uh, I have known Dori for all of my career. She is well known for her contributions to the field when she was at Baylor University. For the last couple of years, she's been at Weill Cornell uh, Medical Center. She's the vice chair of the Department of Urology for research. And as uh, many of you know, she is a prior uh, president of the American Society of Andrology and the American Society for Reproductive Medicine an accomplished basic scientist, heavily funded in urology and andrology. So thank you so much for being here, Dori. Uh, please take it away. Thank you. So, um, I'm, oh, so these are the disclosures for myself and for my fellow Nahid Gunjani, who assisted me with putting together this talk. Next slide. So we're gonna talk about what's known about SARS CoV-2, which is the virus which causes COVID-19. Next slide. So it's been very interesting, I think, when we, we look at uh, sort of the, the infections found in men and women, because there's a huge impact of gender. Men are more likely to be hospitalized and to die of COVID-19 than women. And this data happens to be from New York City uh, that was uh, pulled together uh, by my fellow Nahid, um, where you can see that um, the men, again, um, have a higher frequency of hospitalization and death. Um, but this was not due to having an underlying condition because the impact of that, um, there was no difference between men and women. So it wasn't that they had untreated um, health concerns from not going to the doctor necessarily, but that um, but there, there was this increase in death rate. Next slide. So, you know, gender differences that impact disease severity, it happens in many different conditions. Um, and it can be sort of the yin and the yang of biology and lifestyle. Um, and uh, we're gonna talk mostly about the biology side. Next slide. So when we look at uh, COVID-19 deaths, um, this is actually American data from the uh, CDC, but uh, there is data, there's data from many different countries showing exactly the same trends. And that is that men in general are far more likely to die of COVID than women. Um, and interestingly, younger men have a higher death rate than older men. And then as we can see, even though the rate of death um, is fairly constant for the women um, throughout their lifespan, um, the younger, the, the death rate declines from the younger men. And by the time the men are greater than 85 years of age, they're approaching the death rate of the women. And so um, people realize that this decline in the death rate by gender is reminiscent of the decline in testosterone levels in aging men. Next slide, please. So um, the first thing that was sort of considered is a low T versus high T. And when we think about hypogonadism um, from testosterone deficiency with aging. Um, so next slide. So there was a very interesting study done um, in Italy by Montepoli and colleagues um, where um, they were looking at um, cancer patients. Um, and not surprisingly found that they have an increased risk of um, SARS-CoV-2 infections compared with non-cancer patients. Um, but when they looked at the prostate cancer patient, patients who were getting androgen uh, depletion therapy, um, it appeared to be partially protected from the SARS-CoV-2 infection. And so on the, on the right panel, you can see the data that supports this. And again, the cancer patient, the prostate cancer patients uh, did better than the cancer patients. And the difference between these two groups, A was the prostate cancer, but more it was that they were on androgen uh, uh, deprivation therapy. Next slide. 
So right now, there are a whole series of ongoing studies that are focusing on looking at androgen manipulation um, to try and impact COVID-19 disease severity. Um, and uh, they're also considering, as you'll see, regulation of the androgen receptor gene expression as well. The androgen deprivation therapies, um, not surprisingly, um, include some of the common treatments for advanced prostate cancer, um, certainly treatment with anti-androgens such as bicalutamide, uh, degarelix, uh, as well as looking at some of the other steroid hormones, including progesterone, estrogen, uh, and dexamethasone. And of course, dexamethasone, they're interested in um, from its anti-inflammatory properties, not um, for its potential overlap, say, with progesterone receptor action. Next slide. Now, and so the jury is still out, um, stay tuned. Uh, you'll see that for many of these areas of research, um, the data are incomplete, but I think encouraging. Uh, and so supporting kind of the role of the androgen and androgen receptor in impacting COVID-19 disease severity, there was another study looking at androgen receptor polymorphism. So this is the trinucleotide CAG repeat uh, length, which is um, in the first exon of the androgen receptor. This, is, um, uh, this regulates transcriptional activation by testosterone. Um, and um, so they looked at racial variations in CAG repeat length, which is known to vary um, in different races and ethnicities, um, and looked then at disease severity. And as compared to also how active the androgen receptor was. And so African-American men have a shorter CAG repeat, so a more transcriptionally active uh, receptor. Caucasian men have, um, have um, a somewhat lesser action. And the longest CAG repeat is found in Asian men, um, which is about 25 repeats. So they would have um, a little bit less androgen androgenic activity as a result of ligand interaction with the androgen receptor. So you could think of that in terms of degrees of virulization and so on that are very evident when you look at the individuals. So the men with the shorter androgen receptor CAG repeats have increased androgen receptor activity as compared to the men with the longer repeats. And um, similarly, the men with the shorter CAG repeats have an increase in disease severity compared with those with longer CAG repeats. And this also correlated, as I said, with degrees of virilization as assessed by looking at male pattern baldness, which again is an androgen-mediated characteristic, androgenic alopecia, uh, prostate cancer, um, as well as, um, again, the androgen receptor repeat length and the COVID-19 disease severity. So these ongoing studies appear to be very consistent with this hypothesis of, of the androgens and androgen receptor playing an important role. Next slide. Well, so how does the COVID-19 actually work? Um, COVID-19, uh, which uh, is pictured for you here as kind of the, the round circle, it says SARS-CoV-2, um, has various attachment proteins on, on its outer membrane. And um, this has to attach to a very specific receptor, which is known. Uh, it is called the angiotensin converting enzyme 2 or ACE2 receptor. Um, and this is what allows the virus to enter cells. And the target cells have to have this receptor for the virus to enter. Um, and also important in this is the transmembrane protease serine, Tempras 2, um, which then plays a role in the activation of, of the uh, SARS-CoV-2. Um, so both of these contribute to making the cells more vulnerable to infection. Next slide, please. And um, when we look at some of the, at least in the testis, you can see that um, the ACE2 receptor is present in lytic cells, Sertoli cells, and spermatogonia, whereas Tempras 2 is expressed in the spermatogonia and then um, later in the round spermatids. And um, there was a concern then that there would be a great deal of sort of virus uh, uh, infection in the testis uh, because of this ACE2 uh, receptor being present. Next slide. 
So there's several series um, for virus affecting the testis. Um, it was, it's known that orchitis is a complication of SARS, uh, which is an earlier version of the coronavirus. Um, but the effect of the SARS-CoV-2 on the testis is unclear. And it's unclear also whether damage that is observed is from the virus resulting from inflammation um, or direct from the virus doing the damage itself. Because we know that infection with SARS-CoV-2 initiates kind of a cytokine storm, which is a lot of what is causing the severe illness um, in the patients, causing them to be hospitalized. Next slide. Um, it's also thought that detrimental effects on the testis could occur from the high fevers that, that the patients have uh, who are infected with SARS-CoV-2. Um, so this, in turn, could affect spermatogenesis. Next slide. And then um, um, there was also um, a thought given to the fact that disruption of the Sertoli cells, which maintain the blood testis barrier, um, given the ACE2 receptor presence, could again uh, result in some severe orchitis. Um, that has not been observed yet um, to date. Next slide. Except in children with the Hashimoto type um, uh, uh, complications after COVID-2 infection. But you can see in the uh, histologic uh, picture on the right of the testis that the ACE2 receptor is very highly expressed in the Sertoli cells by the brown staining, which is present in the seminiferous tubules and also in the lytic cells. Next. Um, and there's androgen expression, ex androgen dependent expression of both the ACE2 and the Tempris2 in androgen responsive tissues. And those of you who are work on prostate cancer, know that Tempris 2 is expressed in the prostate as well. Next slide. Um, and it's thought that some of the innate difference in immune response during, versus men versus women has to do with um, both the androgen-dependent expression of both of these proteins as well as um, the relative levels of these steroids between the genders. Next slide. Um, certainly, the men and women seem to have a different comorbidity profile. Next. And, um, but for the men, um, as I told you, there are possible therapeutic approaches which are currently being evaluated um, based upon disruption of androgen receptor signaling. Um, and obviously, we know that's associated with its own set of side effects, but this would be a more transient type of treatment as compared to men with advanced prostate cancer. Next. Well, uh, there's been a big concern about the risk of viral sexual transmission via the semen. Um, and the data, I would say, is still incomplete. Uh, there have been a series of studies uh, which are summarized for you here. This is published. There are several more that are in various states of review uh, um, that will be coming out. And um, so you can see that um, the sample sizes that have been evaluated are still quite small. Um, and the degrees of severity of the infections range. Uh, predominantly, the, the patients who were evaluated had milder disease, with the exception of the Lee paper, which was in JAMA, um, where there, of the six positive patients identified, four were acute, several of them died, um, and two were recovering. Um, but when they actually looked for the virus being present in the semen, um, there were very few incidents where virus was detected. I think that was quite surprising to people. In the Lee paper in JAMA, um, six out of these very ill men, all of whom were um, in intensive care on, um, in the ICU, um, six of them had the presence of virus in the semen, although as we know, these are PCR assays and some of that could have been contamination as well, or the fact that they were so acutely ill um, that either the, say, the blood testis barrier had broken down um, um, or the virus was simply leaching from the testis itself. Um, and um, again, there were some other changes and a few men did report scrotal and testicular discomfort, which again would point to a mild, at least, um, orchitis as a result of the, um, the CoV-2 uh, infection. Next slide. And finally, um, you know, frequently asked should sperm cryo 
preservation occurred during the pandemic, and there's no good answer to this. Um, it's been widely known that there are a number of viruses that can be shed into the semen, sometimes long, long after symptoms abate, and the Zika virus, I think, is a very good example of that. Um, and so far, the data suggests that the viral shedding of the SARS-CoV-2 into the semen appears to be low. There have been low titers of SARS-CoV-2 detected at non-respiratory sites in general, again, implying that at least some of the, uh, the sequelae that are seen in patients uh, who are infected uh, with CoV-2 um, actually are having the side effects of having the cytokine storms uh, as a result of the viral infection. Um, importantly, for sperm banking, the viruses are certainly stable at ultra-low temperatures. So SARS-CoV-2 could be stable after cryopreservation and thawing of semen. Um, and um, it's important to note, though, that so far there have no pre-recorded, no recorded cases of viral cross-contamination between cryopreserved semen samples of any type um, while in storage. Um, and so the risk of cross-contamination during storage is thought to be negligible, but not zero. Um, and um, ideally, you know, the sample should be processed using a lot of uh, secure and safe devices, both to protect the laboratorian, uh, as well as to make sure that uh, there's no viral cross-contamination um, into the cryovials. And, and these cryovials from COVID-2 patients uh, should uh, be segregated for storage. Next. So this slide just summarizes next uh, some of the information that I gave you. The viral detection so far um, in semen uh, has been low, but again, a limited number of individuals have been tested. Um, and uh, where the virus was present for the six had very acute disease and, and many of them were dying. Next. Semen quality, there were two reports showing some impact to sperm count and motility. Again, perhaps not surprising given how ill these patients have been. Next. And cryopreservation of sperm is certainly possible and in specific uh, situations for say patients needing fertility preservation before cancer treatment, it has to be done with the utmost precautions and segregation of the cryovials for storage. Next. Uh, no viral DNA has been detected in the testis itself, which was a surprise. Um, and again, there may be some cases of orchitis in patients uh, who are infected with SARS-CoV-2, but really there's very limited physical findings and uh, been so far no evidence of the virus in the prostate either. Um, and I think that's my last slide. Thank you. So thank you so much, Tori, and thank you for all the talks that we have received, I really want to thank the faculty for giving so outstanding talks. So I'll ask the first question to Sharon. And I think the question actually comes from our editor of the Open Access Journal, Dr. Park, that said, when you talk about the Chinese study, um, this said that there was a decrease in sexual uh, health in the Chinese study, but there's always also been a Turkish study that showed that uh, that actually was an increase during the COVID-19 pandemic. Could you maybe comment a little bit on the different outcomes in these two different studies? And that was for Sharon Paris. Sure. Can we have the slide now, please? So we, we were aware of this question in advance, so I, I prepared a brief response. Uh, but I didn't include it initially because of, uh, because of time. But this was, an, as was mentioned, it was an observational study in Turkey it was done by telephone, so there were some limitations there. And it compared the frequency of sexual intercourse and FSFI scores during the one month of the pandemic versus six to 12 months before. The women were quite young. They were average age of 27, 26. And um, what was noted in this study was the average frequency of the sexual intercourse increased, uh, but it's, I'm sorry, that's reversed. It was, it decreased, but the FSFI scores um, Sorry, average frequency of sexual intercourse increased and the FSFI scores decreased and the desire domain increased. So I guess the question is, um, why did desire increase if the overall increased? And I, I, I think the limitations um, may be important here. This was a telephone survey. 
And the low, uh, the FSFI scores were low at the onset. They were below the cutoff for female sexual dysfunction. So I, I, I don't know what to make of that and how that impacts the response. So they, they did not have, you know, sexual dysfunction at the onset. Um, they, they were spending more time at home. They were young women. The women may have been equating frequency with desire, and it may be cultural differences that explain some of the differences between this and the Chinese study. Um, that's the most I can say in terms of this. Thank you, John. So um, there's a question for uh, Paolo. We've had many questions submitted, and if we don't get to answer your question, we apologize. Uh, many questions submitted ahead of time and since the webinar started. Uh, first of all, I'd like to make a general comment. Um, there is increasing concern in academia, and especially among journal editors, of the concept of rush to publish with COVID, that uh, these papers are almost certainly going to be high impact, and there's a high rate of being accepted, but the science sometimes is not fantastic. And I think methodology is critical here, and that segues nicely into the question for Paolo, which is uh, the two most commonly used questionnaires for erectile function assessment in men are the IIEF and the sexual health inventory for men. They both ask over different periods of time. Can you comment on which questionnaire you would be using in a research study in COVID? Yeah, so it, what you said about the, the, the low quality of methodology, of course, uh, it's true, unfortunately. Uh, if I would uh, design a study uh, regarding the investigated sexual behavior and sexual function in men during the COVID, uh, I would actually use uh, the IAF investigating uh, the four weeks before the, administer the administration of the questionnaire, uh, even though that would be probably not enough, also because uh, uh, the IAF, as we know, has several limitations. First of all, uh, normally, if you do not do not have any sexual activity, your score is zero. But actually, this does not mean that you have erectile dysfunction, for example. So this has, of course, uh, need to be modulated on the different uh, um, situation or, and on the different uh, context that you are using uh, the questionnaire. But uh, this would be probably the, the best questionnaire to use. Thank you. I just have to tell you all that we have been more than 315 participating in this event. So this is really, really nice. And we will continue for a while over one hour because we have so many questions. So just hang on if you still want to be here. We are not going to close down after one hour. So the next question is for Joanna. Um, and it says, uh, dear Dr. Joanna, do you think there could be any preventive actions to take in order to make people aware of the high risk of sexual abuse, physical, emotional, and sexual to children? As a society, is there anything we can do? And I think this is a very important question because you raised some very important concerns with your talk. Yes, Anna Maria. Well, regarding prevention of child sexual abuse, uh, uh, we have to do it before any kind of humanitarian crisis. So as I said before, uh, uh, with a great increase in distress, uh, child sexual offenders have more sexual fantasies with children, for example. So this is a risk factor. Now at the current moment of COVID-19, we have potential victims in confinement with potential offenders and there are no resources to uh, um, security uh, facilities, for example, and that's why we have always to work before any kind of humanitarian crisis. So we know that uh, in any of these crises, uh, children and women are, are the, great, the greatest victims. Um, at, at the moment, we have all countries, uh, in theory at least, uh, taking these uh, very particular politics regarding prevention of sexual violence, including domestic violence. So each country has very specific uh, phone lines and sites where people can report any case uh, if they suspected uh, there is such a case. So the, the best thing society can do is to always report authorities. Never be afraid of reporting to authorities. And then, of course, we have to work in terms of prevention of, of sexual abuse in schools, within family. But this is a, a long-term project, not only something that we, we remember during COVID-19, uh, because it's actually always there. 
Thank you so much, Joanna. So the next question is for um, Dory Lam, and it pertains to the gender issue, which to me is the most interesting question in this area at the moment. And it strikes me, Dory, that I'm looking at male versus female without adjusting for things such as testosterone level, uh, androgen receptor sensitivity, comorbidity profiles. We need to be looking at the full picture to really truly answer um, this question definitively. Um, the question that came in specifically is about the expression of ACE2 in the female, not in the male. Okay, uh, let's see. Well, I know, I know it's expressed in the lung, um, but I don't know about the female reproductive tissues. Um, I mean, I would assume, you know, I would be guessing, all right? Um, I mean, I'm assuming that it's probably in, in some of the female reproductive tract as well, but I don't know that for a fact. Certainly it's highly expressed in the lung, which is why that's such an important point of entry. Um, and, uh, but, but actually, you know, people were very surprised even for the high level of expression that, like in, in the men that we didn't see the virus in the testis itself. So that was a surprise. Um, in terms of the sort of uh, other gender issues, I think that, um, um, you know, it's been known for many years that um, certainly that men um, and, and it's testosterone related, um, uh, have a different response to viral infections than women. It's selective for certain classes of viruses, but I think that that was not such a surprising finding. In terms of, of um, sort of the testosterone level, um, you know, obviously the, the limiting factor is the receptor, right? So the receptor is the limiting factor, even if you have testosterone excess, which you do in most men, right, relative to the binding affinity um, of the androgen receptor. Um, I think at pharmacologic levels of testosterone, you're working through the, the membrane receptor, not the nuclear receptor that we always think about. And so that's a little bit of a different situation. But um, I think in, in normal men, um, still the limiting factor is going to turn out to be the androgen receptor itself. If I could just follow on from that, Dory, there have been uh, many questions, a lot of interest uh, in the questions about whether we should stop testosterone therapy in patients who are on testosterone therapy during the COVID-19 uh, pandemic. So from an evidence-based medicine perspective, I can't give you an accurate answer because the studies haven't been done, all right? But um, again, um, since um, androgen action is limited by the receptor activity, right, not by the, you know, once you, once you have saturated the receptors, um, when you give pharmacologic doses, again, you're affecting other the tissues in other ways that are not natural, right? But if you're bringing androgen, like hypogonadal men with aging, you're bringing them up to the normal range, then then you would assume that they are just as sort of healthy as the men who have the, uh, um, you know, who, who had that level anyway, right? Because that's the normal range. Now, um, again, because simply having the active androgen receptor predisposes to certain viral conditions, um, um, that's why they felt that as a treatment, not as a protective measure, that that might be helpful. I mean, I'm, I'm certain that no one is promoting the idea of giving people anti-inflation therapy um, just to protect them against the virus, because that's not going to do it. Um, but it probably might help a little bit um, for, um, for the patients who are already ill. Okay, the next question is, um, oh, I'm sorry, Dory, I'm sorry. Oh, I was just going to say, but again, I think that the rate limiting step is the receptor, not the steroid itself. So what about women? Some women, I mean, they have differences in, in, in the receptor too, and they also, some women are on testosterone. What do you think about it? So the women are on levels that are lower, obviously, than mm -hmm. the men. Um, and of course, some of the some of the administration is more um, in a local area, right? Um, so you may not have the widespread again distribution mm -hmm. in terms of measuring circulating testosterone levels throughout the body. Nobody has looked at women in this regard. 
Um, and, and again, I think that all of the data is so premature that, you know, I wouldn't really hang my hat on any of it, except that it seems to show a small, you know, positive effect, but it's not going to be the thing that knocks this disease out of the ballpark and gets rid of it or, you know, prevents the death. It may lessen some of the symptoms a bit. Thank you. So we have a question that is actually both Sharon and Paolo. It says about the positive sexual health practices we read on the news. So one, what about sexual intercourse wearing face masks? And are there any studies you are aware of on the LGBTQ plus community? So Sharon, do you have anything about sex with face masks? And do you know of studies on the LGBTQ plus community? So uh, speaking to the first um, comment, some of the departments of health have published recommendations that if you do have sex to avoid kissing or face-to-face -face contact, it doesn't explicitly state that you should wear a face mask. And the same thing is true for the ISSM and ISWISH position statements. It, it's sort of implied that that might be a preventive measure. But there's no specific guideline or research on that. And I, and I reviewed uh, what was available in the literature. I did not see any studies in that specific community. No. Paolo, do you have any comments? I know you, I mean, you, you're from Italy where you also were hit quite strong by, by COVID-19. Uh, so yeah. What were the recommendations? So the Italian, yeah, the Italian Society of Andrology actually is publishing recommendation. It's not yet uh, on PubMed, but it will be soon. Uh, also suggesting to avoid kissing during sex, uh, but not to do, uh, wearing masks. Uh, I'm not sure if this is something uh, uh, I would say useful also because uh, i mean it depends uh, uh, on your partner because if it's uh, someone who you are living with probably it's not uh, it's not useful to, to use this kind of uh, of uh, of measures uh, regarding the lgbtq i do not uh, recall any data about it Thank you. can i say one other thing i did get a question from a patient about whether they could kiss with a mask on um <laughs> Oh, <laughs> I don't know what to say. Not very romantic. <laughs> so uh, I have a question for uh, here for Joanna. But before that, um, thank you all for your comments on, uh, particularly on the testosterone. There's a number of people talk, commenting on testosterone. So um, there's information that's coming out that from Mario Maggi's group that low testosterone levels uh, result in an increased risk of being transferred to the ICU. Um, that's from Dr. Morrison and um, Dr. Hackett in England also uh, reminds us that at the American Diabetes Association me meeting last week that uh, low T was an increased risk for progression to type 2 diabetes. Now, type 2 diabetes, we believe, is recognized as a risk factor for uh, worse disease and death. So uh, this testosterone um, situation is very confusing. There's conflicting data, which means to me that the methodology is not right or the patient numbers are not right. Uh, Joanna, the question for you is about hypersexuality and how you define that. Um, could you comment on that? Yes, John. Well, hypersexuality is generally defined as an excessive and repetitive pattern of sexual behavior, thoughts, and fantasies that interferes with individuals' life. So I would say that an easy way to, to define hypersexuality will be the stressful, out-of-control sexual behavior. So it's not to have too much sex, it is uh, uh, um, to suffer from having, you know, an excessive pattern of sexual outlets. So we have to connect that with the stress. And this is a huge point in, in, in the description of hypersexuality-like conditions. And then, of course, we have uh, other names to describe uh, the same phenomenon. And if we have this historical perspective, we can understand that uh, uh, these names like sexual compulsivity, sexual addiction, sexual impulsivity, they refer to a very specific etiological uh, uh, hypothesis. And that's why we have so many names at the moment. Thank you, Joanna. And a lot of you have been asking whether you can have the slides or uh, there was also a problem that there was no electricity in parts of Iraq. We have attendees from Iraq. So just to make sure that you all know that the, the, the presentations will be online at the ISSM University. So you will be able to see the presentations uh, after this session. So it will be accessible. 
We have another uh, question here. I don't know who it is for, but it says, has there been any research looking at the activity levels within dating apps such as Tinder during the COVID lockdown and whether any meetings were arranged between users despite social distancing measures? I know in Denmark, it's been a lot of discussion whether people should go on Tinder and people didn't go on Tinder and now they were so happy when they could go on Tinder again. So does anyone have any experience about studies looking at that dating apps, Tinder? Uh, I have not seen any studies. and no. uh, But I've heard people say that they think they shouldn't and maybe yeah. now. So there's some understanding that comes from maybe just the general messaging about oh. respecting. Joanna, you had a comment? Yes, yes. Uh, uh, in the previous study that I mentioned, the qualitative study with uh, the perceptions of Portuguese clinical sexologists, uh, among our findings, uh, there is this theme that uh, people are now using more uh, uh, technology and apps to try to connect, to have some kind of relationship with the sexual content uh, with, with a partner. So uh, at least in Portugal, there is some evidence suggesting that people are now using technology to get connected and sexually connected with, with partners, yes. Thank you. So John, you have more questions? Um, so the, when you look at the a question came in about the duration of isolation and its impact on activity, and the durations in the data presented are quite short. Uh, what do we expect will happen after COVID is done? So maybe Sharon and Paolo, whatever sexual dysfunctions or sexual activity changes occur, behavior changes occur during COVID, is there any sense for what you think may happen when COVID is gone and we're back to, let's say, a reasonably normal life? Yeah, so there are data regarding previous uh, pandemia, pandemics uh, showing that uh, people who uh, had some uh, uh, problems in terms of depression and mood deflection due to the pandemic they will face some problems also regarding sexual dysfunction after the end of the pandemic. So this is something that we should monitor uh, in the next few months because probably there, there will be some increase of sexual dysfunction related to, the, to, to depression and, and psychological distress. Um, then, of course, there is also all the, the, the factors related to the fear of contagion that we have already discussed and this is something else that will have any impact. I, I would concur that it uh, will depend on probably psychological and mental health factors as well as the degree of trauma. So, you know, the, the, the experience of someone who was a, a, a healthcare provider in the front line or someone was at home working, you know, in the Silicon Valley and not having any contact and no trauma could be vastly different. And once the restrictions are, list, are lifted, they may respond very differently. Um, and I think it, you also have, I agree, you have to look at the development of co-occurring mental disorders and psychological states. Um, but interestingly, in the Chinese study, the, the younger women were looking forward, as I mentioned, to the opportunity to increase even particularly higher risk behaviors once the pandemic was lifted. And that was about 20% of the women. So people are excited to be let loose again, <laughs> sort of the message. So I think it, it really depends on the factors of the individual and what they went through. And, and, and I, I think uh, that you also mentioned that a lot of the Chinese young people stayed at home. So maybe that has an impact on living with their parents. So are you able to have sex when you're in your parents' home? And maybe this is also related to the next question where we have a question from the Netherlands say, is it possible that our questioners do not cover part of the changes in relationships in the times of lockdown? For instance, the de decrease in masturbation uh, because the partner is always around. So being with your partner all the time. Do you have any comments on that? Maybe Paolo, Joanna or, or Sharon? Yeah, I think that social distancing is the main factor, as I said mm. before. So also in this case, uh, regarding masturbation or whatsoever, it depends really on where and uh, with whom you spent your uh, lockdown phase. Mm. So yeah. this is, uh, this is the, the main factor. Yeah. I think also older women who were looked at as a low, you know, a low occurrence of sexual function and less sexual activity, you know, I, when I speak to them clinically, they aren't, um, there's less of an, there's a variation in the frequency of masturbation and unpartnered sex. 
And the, it, it, it all depends on how this is introduced and how people are educated about that as an option. I think we need to learn more about people's, you know, the, the theory might be that they weren't familiar with this or they had been used to, you know, partnered sex. And we need to study whether those messages are positive. You know, people in, engage this or find it negative to have to have masturbation or sex alone. Um, we need to learn more. Thank you. John, you want to put in the final question? Uh, well, there's a comment here, which I think is, is important, and that is from Dr. Klapalova, um, I believe, from Germany, and it's intimating that Pierre Bricken's lab in, in Hamburg is uh, exploring the um, impact of dating apps on sexual behavior and sexual function and satisfaction. So that is uh, something that's definitely ongoing. Um, there's a question in here about the impact of COVID and the pandemic and lockdown on sex drive. We, we've talked about sexual function in general terms, but Sharon, with regard to sex drive in women, um, could you summarize the impact of uh, the pandemic on, on the drive, on let's say the prevalence of HSDD? So it, it, none of the studies uh, particularly assessed HSDD because they, yeah, well, they looked at um, low desire and distress, but th that is primarily a clinical diagnosis rather than self-report. But I think the, the tendency in the studies that I showed was that the desire was decreased, except for the one Turkish study where it increased slightly, but the, the baseline scores were low. Um, I think it looks like, you know, about a 20% to a third, certainly of women, have reported in the short run, in the four-week trial, you know, timeframes, a decrease in desire. Um, and it goes along with lower levels of frequency and satisfaction. And so, again, we, we need to understand more about the factors and who the vulnerable individuals are. I, 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 the men were somewhat similar, but less. the effect was less. I, Paula can speak to that in sex driving men. Yeah, yeah, I totally agree with Dr. Parrish. Uh, there were conflicting data mainly showing a decrease of sexual desire, but I, I showed, for example, one study conducted in Italy in young men, so the median age was 21, showing actually 40% of them reporting an increase of sexual desire and also increase of auto erotism. So once again, um, we need more data to answer this question and probably depends also from the context. Thank you so much. Um, People aren't at home, excuse me, they're, I said they're not at home getting excited about having, you know, enthusiastic about that. <laughs> yeah, there's been a lot of discussion in Denmark about uh, women being more stressed because they have more to take more care of the household when everyone in isolation. And, and we have seen tendencies in, in the journal environment that, that we have more manuscripts submitted, but it's from male authors and not from female authors. We are trying to do a little survey on that to see if it has an impact on men having more time, but women not during the, the, uh, the pandemic. So it's, it's quite interesting what's happening. Mel, can I have the, the, the next slide? Okay, so I think we have to wrap up. Um, First of all, I would like to thank the faculty, uh, Dr. Paris, Dr. Capgrasso, Dr. Cavallo, and Dr. Lam, so much for participating in this first webinar of the ICSM and, and JSM. It was wonderful talks. I really want to thank you for sharing your big knowledge and experience in the field. I want to thank John for coordinating this and, and for Louis for, for like introducing the whole seminar. I want to thank Mel, but she did a lot of, of technical stuff. She made this possible. And I want to thank you, the audience, for, for being here. Um, it is, has really been a pleasure. As I said, the webinar will be made available on the ISSM University online. So please go in there and watch it again and share it with your friends. And Mel, can I have the next slide? So just before I close, John, do you want to add a, a final comment? Oh, thank you so much for being here and for your excellent questions. And so I just want to advertise for our next webinar. The next webinar will be in collaboration with the World Association for Sexual Health. It will be July the 23rd and it will be on sexual rights at the core of sexual health intervention. So we really hope that we will see you again. 
and uh, that you'll join us the next time. So thank you to all of you. Thank you to the presenters. Thank you to the audience. We reached more than 315 people joining this webinar. So have a nice day, night, morning, wherever you are in the world. Thank you. Anna Maria, I'd like also to thank you and John and all the speakers. Uh, you, the moderators, uh, did a very nice job also. Uh, thank you uh, all for that. Thank you. Let's take care, all of you.